I'd like to thank you and welcome you uh, for coming to our second event um, of our 16th annual symposium. This year, obviously, we're focusing on indigenous rights and environmental justice. And today, our panel is about climate change and um, refugees. So it's going to be a very interesting panel. And first of all, I'm going to introduce Professor Peter Van Arsdale, and then he will further introduce our panelists today. So Dr. Peter Van Arsdale is the Director of African Initiatives at the University of Denver, where he also serves as an adjunct professor. He is an applied cultural anthropologist with foci in East Africa, Southeast Asia, the Balkans, Latin America, and North America, specializing in human rights, community water resources, refugee resettlement, and humanitarian intervention. Dr. Van Arsdale is also a senior researcher at E Cross Culture Corporation. He is a noted author, journal editor, and former president of the National Association for the Practice of Anthropology and is known for his Tree of Rights and the Theory of Obligation. He is a co-founder of the Denver Hospice and has studied a band of previously uncontacted Sitak and Kurawai people in Indonesia, New Guinea. Since 1979, he has been a fellow of the Explorers Club. So with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Peter Van Arsdale. Thank you. That very, very nice introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be a participant, and I won't be speaking much today because we have two distinguished participants who will be doing most of the talking, as they should be. My role is a facilitator and moderator, and uh, when we get to questions, and we'll probably save most of our questions for, for the end so that our two panelists have a chance to, uh, to share their information and observations. Um, second reason I'm delighted to be here is that, uh, as many of you students know, I had the pleasure of serving as the core faculty advisor prior to our friend and colleague, uh, Claude Estray. And so, for the several years that I served as CORD's faculty advisor some years ago, it meant a great deal to me. And CORD has also been, always been, close to my heart. I'm just going to say a couple of things to set the stage. And, of course, then, uh, first, Ben Nanda, and second, Alice Thomas will be speaking. Um, Ben, I've known for uh, over 30 years. We've been friends and colleagues for that period of time. We were 15 at that time. We were <laughs> both 15 years of age. Thank you, Ben, for adding that. That's a very accurate <coughs> comment to our discussion. <laughs> um, Alice, I've known by work, but not in person until today. But I've followed her work extensively. Both these people are extremely knowledgeable in the systemic sense on the topic that we're going to be discussing today. The only other thing I'm going to say before I first introduce Ben, and then he'll be followed by Alice, is that in some cases, people feel that the environmental refugee, the so-called environmental refugee, is a newer category. And in some ways, that may be true. Um, but I'll guarantee you, as we see the intersection among environmental rights, refugee rights and issues, and human rights writ large, uh, we certainly see and reflect upon, for example, the work of the 2004 uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, the late uh, Wangari Maathai of Kenya, whose interests intersected the same topics we'll be discussing today. And she did that from a Kenyan point of view, building on her environmental and women's rights interests. We see um, various groups that we're connected with now, like Global Green Grants. Global Green Grants has a strong interest in what we're doing. And in complementing the work of, for example, Alice's organization, Refugees International. And so several of us have, not me personally, but several of our students have worked with Global Green Grants. And so we see a direct connection there, too. And the final thing I'll say before I introduce Ved is that having worked in New Guinea, and I have a chance this Friday when I present on indigenous issues at the same symposium Friday afternoon to discuss New Guinea, it's fascinating to see that even there, we see environmental refugees. For example, in 1997, the El Nino effect, the El Nino meteorological effect, caused drought. It caused environmental refugees in, of all places, the highlands of New Guinea. So this topic is of tremendous importance, and I'm delighted to begin by introducing my good friend, Ben Nutt. Thank you, Peter, and uh, thanks, Gord, 
May I ask uh, the officers of board who are present here to stand up and mm -hmm. take a bow? There they are. Thank you for asking me, and I'm um, honored and delighted to be with you. I uh, see um, a few students from here that uh, are in my international human rights law class that each year in the fall, I uh, uh, with a student from here, about a dozen, dozen from the law school, and I look forward to having some of you again next fall. Um, I have a few colleagues here, thank you for coming, and all of you present, delighted. And before I say a couple words about uh, what I'm going to say on the topic, I have um, um, not simply thanked Teresa and all the cohorts who have worked very hard on it, uh, but also I want you to know that mine is simply a warm-up act. I've got here an expert who works in the field. <coughs> I simply do done law review articles and books. <laughs> I've done one on refugee law, written about it. But the part simply is that those who do field work and are involved in day-to-day -day challenges, problems, opportunities, I look forward to hearing that and look forward to be enlightened. And the third thing that I want to say is, as uh, Peter began by giving an example, that uh, we are not here in order to have that gloom and doom scenario put it in front of you. And we are not here in order to have those dark kind of predictions uh, because um, uh, the UN's uh, inter uh, this panel on climate change just uh, said that uh, these numbers that people have been tossing around as to how many hundreds of millions are going to become environmental refugees, that these are tentative numbers, but that the problem is real. And so as we um, look at this uh, problem, uh, I think we need to know how at the present time all these people, we call them environmental migrants, environmental refugees, or give any other name you want to. Uh, but these are the people who, at this stage, have, do not have international protection. Many of you probably have been following um, the problems and challenges that refugees face today. I was just uh, thinking about it. Today's paper, yesterday's paper, New York Times, today talks about more South Sudanese seek shelter at UNBCs and talks about uh, 1.5 million displaced people, 500,000 who have fled to neighboring countries also, and 115,000 who are in the UN camps. And that is just simply South Sudan. And then I think you probably know that, um, obviously you do, what has happened in Syria, that uh, the numbers are absolutely astounding. Uh, internally displaced persons, almost six million. Outside the country, in all these adjoining countries, more than 2.5 billion, million. And uh, that <coughs> number, um, I think, baffles us because the international community uh, does step forward, but not hasn't done as much as is needed. Because um, yesterday's paper in the New York Times again. Refugees in Syria starving after ISISC, ISIS, UN says. And uh, is talking about the 3.8 billion that the countries have pledged, but UN <coughs> seeks about double of that. And that is not there at the present time. So I think uh, the point simply is that um, uh, we are um, aware of these uh, refugee problems. Uh, but we are aware of those refugee problems, more, more of us, simply academically or uh, in a, a not very concrete form, because unless you are one, you can't really fathom the kind of vulnerability, the um, um, helplessness, total helplessness at times, 
you may remember at least the reading the books. You haven't probably at that time heard about it. You are not even here on the earth. But uh, all those Vietnamese rickety boats leaving their own homes, being um, um, very, very vulnerable to sea pirates and people who rob them, and then sitting in Hong Kong and in fenced kind of places for years. Uh, it's a very sad kind of commentary. Uh, we have now this year, last year, brought in thousands of Bhutanese refugees who for many, many years had been sitting in um, um, kicked out of Bhutan, went up to the Himalayan kingdom of Nepal, and Nepalese did not give them any rights, and they were simply in camps rotting for years. And finally they are here, and today you probably know about them, that the suicide rate among them is the highest. So I uh, won't uh, talk more about it, but uh, I don't know how many of you know how many displaced persons, asylum seekers, and refugees are today in the world. Uh, those who think that they are about uh, 10 to 15 million, if you raise your hands, 20 million, 25 million, 30 million, 40 million, 50 million, and I think most of you haven't raised your hands because you don't know what the heck it is, what the numbers are. And so not that you are not interested in knowing, but you don't know. And the numbers at, um, in 2014, when uh, the United Nations uh, Human Rights, uh, not the Human Rights, but the United Nations Committee <coughs> on um, Refugees, uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, they gave the number, and the number was 51.2 million refugees and asylum seekers. And these people who at the present time are outside their homes and are seeking uh, some kind of uh, shelter. Uh, and it's uh, again uh, that vulnerability, because you have probably seen those pictures of people trying to climb those walls and getting into Europe, or those who have been in their boats, and boats have capsized and are close to Italy. Probably again, thousands of people who died last year trying to leave their homes in order to get there. Now these are the people who are obviously seen as economic refugees. Those who um, have lost their livelihood because of uh, famine or because of war or because of restlessness. And again, the international community is not there at times to assist them. Uh, they are trying, but uh, you probably know or don't know that um, what uh, Peter was talking about, uh, Africa, uh, along with uh, the International Convention on Refugees, Africa was one of those con the continents that many, many years ago went beyond that very narrow definition of refugee that was given in the convention. And second, African countries were so compassionate and willing to assist that they had opened their doors. <coughs> and all of a sudden, the time came when their own people were hurting. And refugee influx became totally intolerable. Closed their doors, kicked them out, and that happened in many African countries. So that compassion fatigue. And then many of these developing countries where there are, look at Pakistan, from Afghanistan, how many people there. And, and it's not simply one country. You can see many, many countries in the same sad plight. And uh, nobody seems to, well, I shouldn't say nobody seems to care. There is at times that compassion fatigue. And uh, the developing countries say, well, let us uh, have some burden sharing. And the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees keeps trying very hard. And then there was at least one very basic element in our refugee law, and that is a non refoulema. That uh, you do not kick out a person if you know that where that person is going to go back to his own country or anywhere, he or she is likely to be persecuted. 
do not kick them out. But that non-refulema is simply an abstract kind of principle not being followed by many countries. There are asylum rules that a person who has come seeking asylum, you must give him or her at least a day in court. At least listen to pers that person. Have some kind of regulations, rules, that you decide upon the facts whether that person is fit for asylum or not. And that's not followed. So let me just uh, take a few minutes on um, what we are supposed to talk today um, these environmental refugees and um, why at the present time we don't find <coughs> any help for them. Because the convention that was uh, uh, done in 1955 on refugee affairs, the international convention, you remember 1951 was after the Second World War. That was the time when all that death and destruction of the Second World War the helplessness of people fleeing from uh, their own countries, that was the setting. And most of them, many of them, they had been persecuted by those Nazis. And that was a different era. At that time, there were no environmental considerations. There were no environmental, quote unquote, environmental migrants or refugees. That issue was not there. And so at that time, what they have been saying is, that those who are persecuted, and I think uh, many of you probably know the definition, but let me at least uh, read it to you, the one sentence that most of you know. A person who, owing to a well-founded fear of persecution, of being persecuted for reasons of, and these are the reasons, race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality, is unable or owing to such fear, is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. So you can see these are the simple elements that the refugee must have fled his or her home country. A refugee must be unwilling or unable to return home. That inability or unwillingness to return home must be due to a well-founded fear of persecution. And then, what are the reasons? Persecution must be related to refugees' membership in a particular group. That is a race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. <coughs> and obviously, as you can see, at that time, there was no thought of these environmental migrants, those who are leaving <coughs> their own homes because of they cannot have livelihood. And here I might uh, just refresh your memory or remind you something that you do know, all of you, that it can be caused by two possibilities. One is uh, natural causes, and uh, second today is uh, climate change. And um, um, I just uh, especially wanted to have these categories that uh, you think about them, that environmental degradation, it is drought, soil erosion, desertification, deforestation, and associated problems that you, you can think of, population pressure, profound poverty. And uh, their counterpart that you can see is climate change hazards. What are they? You understand again. Sea level rise, increases in storm activity and their strength, drought, desertification, water shortages. And I think the point simply would be that when you think about accelerated climate change, and nobody is at the present time challenging that the climate change is not going to happen. And nobody is going to challenge that uh, sea level rise is not going to happen. And nobody can challenge that uh, there are countries like Bangladesh and then all these small island states in the Pacific. And uh, you probably know that there are some that at the present time are realistically and uh, very actively thinking about leaving their own place, island, 
going to New Zealand, going to Australia, finding a place for all their inhabitants to go. And Maldives, and there are many other countries, and that is the kind of setting that you can see. And uh, then you can probably say that um, um, these possibilities, um, one, the submersion of these lands, um, and I think that is a reality. And I'd say imminent or real threat to those in low sea level areas. And then climate change that is exacerbating the effects of traditional environmental hazards by increasing their frequency intensity and leading to large environmental migrations. Um, international organization for migration had, uh, there are many who have talked about what those um, environmental refugees are, and I think I need to wrap it up in what, five minutes. So let me just very quickly mention that to you, that uh, they have given a definition, and I want to read it. Environmental migrants are persons or groups of persons who for compelling reasons of sudden or progressive changes in the environment Peter, I thought you were thinking of me. <laughs> no, I was not thinking of you, but this time I was not thinking of you. <laughs> you expect a facilitator to take care of people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I simply want you to know it's not only the environmental refugees who suffer. <laughs> so environmental migrants are persons or group of persons who, for compelling reasons, of sudden or progressive changes in the environment that adversely affect their lives or living conditions are obliged to leave their habitual homes or choose to do so either temporarily or permanently and who move either within their country or abroad. And climate refugees that are those due to sudden or graduate alterations in the natural environment related to at least one of the three impacts of climate change. Sea level rise, extreme weather events, and drought and water scarcity. And um, um, I think uh, you can see that in this definition, what they are saying is that uh, those um, migrants, environment migrants that we call them, they are not only those displaced by environmental event, but also those whose migration is triggered by deteriorating environmental conditions. Then environmentally induced movements can take place within as well as across international borders. It can be both long and short term. <coughs> Population movements triggered by environmental forces can be forced as well as a matter of choice. Um, there are several possibilities. There are people who are saying that we are to un up the United Nations Environmental Program. It also defines, I think I'll just give only one there more. They say environmental refugees are those people who have been forced to leave their traditional habitat, habitat temporarily or permanently because of a marked environmental disruption, natural and are triggered by people that jeopardize their existence and, and are seriously affected the quality of their life. And uh, on causes and all that I won't go, uh, but I simply want to conclude by telling you that the present convention that based upon which we have got our own laws, based upon which the countries are supposed to provide asylum and give help and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees goes way beyond that uh, definition, but still environmental refugees as such, or environmental migrants are not included. Um, true, we don't have the statistical data. And because that data is not there, people keep saying, who are they? How many are they? We don't know them. Second, they are saying, we don't know how long they are going to stay. They might go back home. Floods come and go, people go back. Where do they stay? And then so there are all kinds of issues 
But the point simply that I want to make for you is that at the present time, that treaty does not, does not protect environmental migrants. There are some of my colleagues who have tried to stretch that convention in order to say they are persecuted, but you know, they are not persecuted by their own government. There is no intent to do harm. There are causes that are beyond the causes that at that time were included as the basis for that convention. And so, what are many of the people at the present time suggesting? Uh, my friend is going to give us the last word as to what we do and what the gaps are. Uh, but at the present time, all that I want you to know is that there are many of my colleagues who have said, let us have a new international instrument. Let us have a new international treaty. And there are some who have said international treaty should be only on those natural hazards. Others have said international treaty should also be only be on climate. There are some who have said international treaty should include both of them. And then there are all kinds of processes and you know ways in order to put that into effect. Uh, but at the present time, all that I want to say is that this is an issue of utmost importance, that we have not paid attention to it, that we have ignored it, and I want you to know that uh, if that event happens, where should you go? You probably are saying, well, what should I do? New York Times, my Bible, has in September an article, and it said, think about it. And, and uh, you will probably like it. Go to Detroit. <laughs> Detroit is a very good place. Second, it said, the best place is Pacific Northwest. So people used to go to California. Now I think you should go to Portland, Oregon. It's a good place. <laughs> and, uh, and second, they said, uh, you know what's going to happen? Alaska is going to become Florida of tomorrow. <laughs> so if you don't have a place at the present time, take it from me. You don't have to pay me anything, but go buy some land in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> Great to, uh, to hear from our good friend, Yvette and Allison, you are, are you going to speak from there? Or the first here. From here? I think you'll find that like Yvette, who's a Renaissance man, Alice is a Renaissance woman. So uh, we're delighted you're here, and we're delighted to hear from you. And again, remember, we'll have time for questions and comments after our two speakers. And I believe you have some also questions, don't you, Alice? Yeah, I have. students who have really helped me make my trip really pleasurable and easy. Um, before we go to the PowerPoint, um, I wanted to just share with you a little information about the organization I work for. Uh, Refugees International is an independent nonprofit organization based in DC that advocates on behalf of refugees and displaced people. Uh, we don't provide services to refugees and displaced people, we just advocate on their behalf. And we do that by going to countries uh, around the world that are experiencing displacement crises, either from conflict or disasters. And uh, we do independent assessments of the needs, of the protection and assistance needs of, of displaced people. And then we take that information and we bring it back to uh, you know, people who have power, whether they are um, policymakers, uh, government decision makers, um, Congress, who holds the purse strings, uh, and US assistance. And we, we advocate for increased assistance and protection. Uh, my organization was founded 35, 36 years ago during the Chinese crisis for, you know, to take care of refugees from into China. Um, and this program that I came to refugees to work, Refugees International to work on, is very new. 
So here's an organization that for, for decades has been, you know, covering conflict displacement, and suddenly they are confronted with this new dilemma. Um, and a lot of the thinking for the program came out of what happened in Darfur, um, where, you know, uh, pastoralist communities um, started, you know, resources were, go, were um, getting short, and there, there, were, there was a lot of increase in tension among pastoralists and farmers. And it was this uh, tension over uh, natural resources that actually many believe was one of the reasons that sparked the conflict. Uh, now we all know what the result of that was. Um, and at the time, the president of our Refugees International um, was very concerned that we were going to see a lot more of this happening in the future. So um, I'm going to go through, I have a bunch of slides. Um, I'm going to go through them. And also I have a, a short film that we put together um, on some interviews we did in the field from uh, West Africa that give you a, a little bit of a sense of how people on the ground are experiencing this. If you can't hear me, just, just let me know. So um, we're going to go through some of the uh, information that Professor Nanda covered very well, but maybe with a little bit more focus on um, what's, what's currently happening to address some of these protection gaps. Um, so there are three primary ways that this is happening on the ground. Um, the most visible, tangible way is that we're seeing more extreme weather events. And um, the impacts are, are huge, and they're not just related to the fact that there's increasing wind intensity, more storm surge, more rainfall, even flooding, but it's being combined with other factors that are non-climate related, like population growth, um, informal settlements, poor environmental practices, and these, this is what makes this issue very complicated, is there's not always clear causation. Um, but there are now very good data about how many people are displaced by these types of events, and, and IDMC, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, estimates that 27 million people per year are displaced as a result of sudden onset disasters. And that is more people that are newly displaced every year from conflict. Um, and we have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change come out with its fifth assessment report last year, which unsurprisingly predicted that over the course of the century we are going to see a significant <coughs> increase in displacement from the effects of climate change. Um, a much more tricky area is gradual changes, is when people, you know, it's not the sudden flood, it's, you know, the, the, the small flood that came the third year in a row and I can't really recover <coughs> from it, I can't really, um, plant, you know, I don't have enough money anymore, I'm in debt, I can't plant my crop anymore, so I'm just going to leave my land and I'm going to go to the city. Uh, these people are treated as economic migrants, but these gradual changes in terms of, you know, uh, deep, you know, just small changes in rainfall variability have enormous impacts on people that are dependent for their livelihoods on rainfall and, and agriculture. Um, small changes in, in, you know, fisheries or species migration can have enormous impacts on people's ability to survive. Now, and the third area, which is probably the most profound, is of course sea level rise because that threatens. Um, the very existence of entire nations and cultures, um, and, and that is a problem that has yet to be addressed. And we'll talk about that. So what do we know? Um, we know we're already seeing people that are being displaced. Um, even in Alaska, there are um, Native American communities there that are, are trying to relocate inland because of melting permafrost. Um, and there are, I don't know if you've read about Kivalina and some of these towns that are um, literally falling into the sea, um, and they are trying to move inland. So in the Arctic, it's particularly problematic because the temperatures are uh, rising at twice the rate in the Arctic as they are on the rest of the planet. So they are sort of the canary in the, in the coal mine in terms of what we're likely to see in the future. Um, we know that most displacement will be internal, um, at least according to experts. And this is where um, people don't always hear that message because of course, you know, how to flee your country is a very big problem for all the reasons that Professor Amanda outlined in terms of refugees and what it is to be a refugee and what it is to not, to be outside of your country. Um, but most of these people are going to be within their own countries. So there's a lot that needs to happen on the state level and by national governments to start dealing with this beyond, you know, refugee rights and stuff. There's a lot more that needs to be focus on that. Um, and, and this has significant impacts on you know, urbanization, people lose their land rights, 
Um, you get trapped rural populations that don't have the money to move, and then they you know, are at greater risk. And it, it raises all kinds of protection issues for people, even within their own countries. Um, and then we also know that like refugee flows, it's usually the developing world that takes on other people from other developing countries. People who you know, had to flee Somalia in 2011 because of the drought didn't have the resources or ability to get on a plane and fly to JFK. Um, they walked across the border to Kenya. Um, and that's what you're going to see, is, is people largely you know, going across the border. Um, probably the most important part of it for, for, for some of us and for me is, is that it really is the people who are the least responsible for the problem who are going to suffer the most. Um, and um, the reason that the most the poorest and most fragile states are most at risk is because um, they just happen to have higher exposure to, to, cl to climate risk. They have more storms, floods, typhoons. Um, but in, in <coughs> they have pre-existing vulnerabilities. So um, they don't have the, the resources to respond to disasters. I mean, even here, you know, think Katrina. Like, we, we didn't even have the ability to respond to the needs of our own people um, in one of the richest countries in the world. Um, and who suffered? It was poor people that suffered. Um, so it's invariably people who don't have resources that don't get sufficient protection. Um, and then, you know, if, if we thought it was bad here, I mean, if you go to countries where there really is no government structure, or very weak government structures, people don't have anybody to turn to. They don't get relief at all. This is an outdated map, but I, I just, I have it on my wall at my office, and I think it's so telling, is that, um, these are the, this is a map of you know, the dark blue countries are those at most at risk of, of um, climate change. And I think there's been a lot of focus, you know, of course, on Bangladesh. I mean, you know, such so enormous amounts of, um, of Bangladesh are at low elevations and will be inundated. Very high population. But, but it's these fragile states across um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. The Horn of Africa there you see. Um, and then Yemen, that's the bottom of the Arabian Peninsula there. I mean, these are the countries that are also prone to war. So you're going to see this very complex mix of what we call complex emergencies. It's not just a war, it's a war and a drought, or a war and a drought and failed crops, and it's, it's a variety of things that are going to come together. Um, so what don't we know? Well, as Professor Nanda said, there's been all kinds of wild estimates about okay, what are we talking here? How many people are going to be affected? Um, and people have really backed away from numbers. I mean, I'll show you some numbers on the next slide, but there's very much a realization that the extent of the problem is going to be defined by what we do about it. Um, and what we do about it as emitting GHG emitting countries, and then also what people do to adapt to it. So, it's not like this is all going to happen in one day. It's going to happen over the course of decades. And how many people end up displaced will depend on how well we prevent the problem and how well we adapt to those irreversible impacts. Um, these are, you know, you'll see there are no recent in estimates on here because people have really backed away from estimates. Um, but you see that, that they range all over the board. Um, so then there's this very interesting question about whether climate is going to fuel conflict. Uh, and um, a more recent you know, conflict is obviously Syria, and there's been a lot of writing about how the prolonged conflict in Syria prior, to, prior to, the, to the conflict actually was responsible for the conflict. And I don't think, frankly, that what I've read is I don't think there's a, a firm link between the drought and the, and the conflict itself, itself. What there is is there's evidence that widespread drought combined with very poor government policies in response to the drought and response to the needs of farmers has led to a lot of civil discontent. And that civil discontent, then um, people can act on it when suddenly somebody decides to take up arms and take on a conflict. So it's not always monocausal, and there's not uh, very much evidence that there are going to be water wars. Um, what there is evidence of is that like in Darfur, there were a lot of things that led to the conflict, and then you had this this uh, conflict over over land due to you know water scarcity that was contributing to it, and that can be the, the thing that kind of sparks the conflict or um, you know makes it worse. Um, 
Professor Nanda did a great job of outlining the gaps. I mean, there is no, there is no inclusion um, in the Refugees Convention for people displaced, or there's, there's no such thing as a climate refugee. Uh, the term is very descriptive, but it, it's legally inaccurate. Um, and I'll, I'll just say one thing about that, and I talked to Kristen about this last night, because I, it was a really eye-opening experience for me when I went, you know, I had read about this, and I've read all the, the academic papers that probably your colleagues have written, and they talked about this is what a new convention would look like, this is what a protocol to the Refugees Convention would look like, here's how we would do this legally. And there was this panel of a bunch of white people talking, professors, talking about all these, you know, what the Pacific Islands could do, and how they were going to do it, and how they were going to move, and what legal protection we were going to give them. And somebody from the Solomon Islands stood up and said, I do not accept being called a refugee. Um, I, refugees are people who are being persecuted by their own government. Um, we are not being, our government is not persecuting us. It is the developed world that is persecuting us. So we do not want to be called refugees, for one. And number two, I do not accept this problem. I do not accept that the, um, the international community will not do something and will not let this problem get so bad that I actually will have to abandon my land. Because I am my land, and I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion here in the context of indigenous communities that people are defined by their land um, in most of the world. I mean, we're, we're mobile people. We move around with no problem. But a lot of these people, they, are, they trace their ancestry back you know, for hundreds or if not thousands of years, so they are defined by where they live. Um, and so they're not willing, you know, it's not like they want to move to New Zealand, they want to stay where they are. Um, so within states, um, you know, under human rights law principles and, and some national laws, your, your government is responsible for protecting you. But as we know, there are problems with implementation and, and usually poor disenfranchised people do not get protected um, when they're forced to flee their homes. Um, and we have this, this issue of statelessness, uh, the prospect of people from low-lying islands that will lose their nationhood altogether. Um, and what would that look like? Um, would they have voting rights in the UN? Would, uh, it's unlikely that some country is going to cede territory to Vanuatu or the Maldives. So would you have, you know, you'd have people that are citizens, but they live in, a, you know, in, you know, they live outside any country. Uh, you'd have a government in absentia, and it raises all kinds of issues. Um, that again, a lot of a lot of Pacific, Pacific Islands don't even want to discuss. Um, so, what's being done to be, address the issue? Um, there is work that's happening within the UN climate change negotiations. Um, language on um, the need for countries to cooperate to address this issue has been included in the agreements. It's, there's going to be an attempt to include that in the, in the Paris Agreement. Um, which is the, the upcoming climate negotiation that's happening in December in Paris where the international community is supposed to come up with a new agreement on climate change. But generally, it hasn't gone beyond a lot of very soft language. It's about we should enhance understanding and cooperation. There's no real, like, du jour solution in there. Um, there was discussion about loss and damage, and I'll say very briefly, is that there was this, this idea has been brought up that, um, you know, countries that are most responsible for greenhouse gas emissions should compensate countries for irreparable losses from climate change, including permanent displacement. That has um, been raised. It has been totally unaccepted by the United States, which does not accept the idea of being liable in any sense to any other country for climate change, uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, but um, it just shows you that the political sensitivities are really hard, and so it's unlikely that the, the, the new agreement that we're going to see in Paris is going to really do much to, to address the issue. A much more promising initiative um, is something called the Nansen Initiative, and it is, a, it, it is an initiative that, of the Norwegian and Swiss governments. It's been led with support of other governments. And basically, what they've done, in short, is that they have gone around to different regions of the world, and they have brought regional governments together and they've talked about, you know, how are you seeing this happen within your country and are you seeing it happen across the border? Are you seeing people fleeing? So like in Central America, I went to the consultation and people talked about Hurricane Mitch when people had to leave um, uh, Honduras altogether. Um, they talk about, um, you know, it was very, so it, it, it talks about the context and one thing that's very illuminating about it is that this is going to happen very differently depending on where you are. 
Um, so there's no one solution to how to address this. So it looks at how these, this displacement is going to play out, depending on where you live, and then it starts talking about what, what solutions are, you know, are acceptable to these countries. So for instance, in Central America, they do have humanitarian visas. So after that Haiti earthquake, which is not climate related, but um, you, know, you could get a humanitarian visa um, to go to the Dominican Republic if you were injured and to get assistance, but it was temporary. You, you came, you got the assistance you needed, and then you know, when the disaster's over, you go back. And that's something that countries and governments are comfortable with. What they're not comfortable with is saying that you know, we're permanently going to accept a lot of people you know, if there's a big disaster you know, in some country. So they're looking for very realistic decisions that are very contextual from, a, as I said, a bottom-up state-led. So it's not the international community, a bunch of people in Geneva telling the rest of the world what they're going to do. It's countries deciding on a regional basis how they're going to solve the problem. Um, I'm going to go to Geneva next week where they're going to produce sort of this global protection agenda where they're going to introduce kind of what um, consolidate all this learning from South Asia, Central America, Africa, the Pacific into something. I don't know what a protection agenda is, but we'll see what they're proposing. Um, but I think they're looking for an institutional home for this issue, which today is really not clear. Um, a lot of people don't think it should be in the UN. Um, a lot of people don't think UNHCR is the right organization to manage this issue. Um, a lot of people do not think IOM is the right organization to manage this issue. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens next week. And, and um, by the end of the year, there'll be a big conference and there'll probably be some outcome. There's also some work being done on government-led relocation in the context of disasters and climate change. It's pretty interesting. I will say that um, this is a very controversial issue. Relocation is very controversial. Um, and it is needed as a protection measure for people who live in at-risk areas. There's no question there are people living where they should not be living. And, and even if there was no climate change, there are people living where they shouldn't be living. I mean, just look at the coast of New Jersey. I mean, there are people that shouldn't live in these places. There's too much development. Um, however, when you talk about you know, government-led relocation programs, the history we had in that area, if you look at large-scale dam relocation, has been horrendous. I mean, people end up poor um, and far worse off. So there is some discussion about this, and there's an attempt now to develop some guidance on that. There was a report in the back of the room that we did on the Philippines, which is now undertaking a very large-scale post-Typhoon Haiyan relocation program. They're trying to relocate a million people. And that report warns that um, there's a lot of risks associated with that. Not take too much time. Okay, so um, more importantly, what, what do we see on the ground? Um, I have covered um, the, the main acute disasters I've covered are the Pakistan floods, flooding in Colombia, um, and then Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines last year. Um, these are my observations. First of all, all the, the displacement is massive. I mean, you can't, I mean, nine million people were displaced in Pakistan. That's enormous. So it's, yes, in Syria, after three years of the war, we've seen um, you know, very large numbers as well. But these, these are very, very large numbers that happen very quickly. They happen immediately in the course of you know, weeks. So managing that amount of displacement is a huge challenge. However, people want to go home, and they usually go home within a year. So you're not seeing protracted populations. You're not seeing the refugee situation when people are born in Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya. I mean, you're, these people, if there's good humanitarian response and good protection in place, people should be able to go home. Um, we're seeing, um, again, the same problems with displaced groups and vulnerable groups, you know, whether it's the, the disabled women, or particularly poor and indigenous and disenfranchised groups that don't have, um, you know, discriminated against, but they're discriminated against during the response too, and that's, that's probably where I see the worst um, human impacts. Um, and then there's a lot of issues around evictions um, that happen, and we were talking a little bit earlier about this in the context of land rights, that this is a very big issue about land rights. Disasters often affect people's land rights, and, and a lot of people end up losing land rights, and if you know, don't have a lot of land rights to begin with, it's, it's very likely that you could be forcibly displaced. Um, and then we have the slow onset disasters, much more complicated to unpack what's happening here, but. I was in the, the Sahel region of West Africa, um, and there was they were they had their third drought. I mean, 
in seven years. Um, and and this, this is the kind of thing where you see tipping points, where you're really tipping, the, I mean, these are the poorest, the poorest countries in the world. So just small changes in rainfall, um, you know, people can't survive. So I'm going to end, um, I'm going to show, let me just see what the next slide is. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly go through these, and then I'll show the, the film from the Sahel, which is much better than me talking. Um, so we need to talk about, you know, what do states do today? And there was a big conference in Japan, Sendai, on disaster risk reduction. Did anybody follow that? No. Nobody cares. It's, it's like boring. Boring. Okay. Even in my organization, boring. <coughs> This is so important. This is different from conflict because we can prevent a lot of the harm. We can, you know, we can do development better. We can protect rights. We can put, you know, safety nets in place. We don't invest enough in disaster risk reduction. And this isn't just natural mother nature things. This is like we know what, how different parts of the world are going to be affected pretty much by climate change. So, I mean, some of it is extreme and unpredictable, but there are things like there's going to be less water in certain parts of the world. We need to invest now, um, but it's really, really hard to find a political will, particularly in this economic global climate, for countries to make the investments they need to, to, they need to be making. Um, they, um, the other thing is really an emphasis on human rights um, and on, on, on a rights-based approach to the response. And these, these tend to be things that are you know, managed by governments, um, but civil society needs to do a much better job at looking at disasters and their impacts on, on communities and doing a much better job of, of ensuring that you know, both managing disasters and, and preventing them, it's, it's got to be community-based. The community is, is the first responder. They're the person that's there on the ground when it happens. You need to give them the, the, the resources to actually <coughs> Improve, the, improve, you know, improve prevention response. Um, humanitarian agencies have a long way to go, too. Um, and um, I'm not going to go a lot into that. My organization kind of gets down hard on the UN for, um, for not responding well to crises. But I think um, you know, it, it's a huge burden on the international humanitarian system right now when they have the Middle East. And, now, and then they have large-scale disasters um, like the typhoon in, in, in the Philippines. Um, but there needs to be um, a lot more done in that space as well. And I think there's some good, good developments. But I'll leave it there. Um, OK, so I'm going to, if I can figure this out, I'm going to show this little film. I think it's not too late. OK. Um, hmm. for our eye. So it was a little bit about, you know, to show what we do, but it gives you a good sense. This is an excellent we, we permit commercial. Okay. okay. <laughs> so again, this is in this is in Burkina Faso in West Africa.
Remarks. It's like you guys planned this for six months, the way that they so beautifully you know, complimented. It was a year. A year, a year of planning in advance. <laughs> so this is terrific, and I sure appreciate both of it. I'll just say one or two things before we open it up for questions and comments from our friends. And if you feel good about leaving here with this, with this microphone, we'll leave it.